yes or no to this statement, Israel can live with a nuclear Iran. A debate from Intelligence Squared US. I'm John Donvan. We have four superbly qualified debaters to argue for and against this motion, Israel can live with a nuclear Iran. Our debate, as always, will go in three rounds, and then you, the live audience, votes to choose a winner, and only one side wins. And on the side arguing for the motion, James Dobbins. He is the Director of International Security and Defense Policy Center at RAND. His partner is Reuven Pedetsur, a Senior Military Affairs Analyst with Haaretz. <laughs> On the side arguing against the motion, Israel can live with a nuclear Iran, Shmuel Bar. He is Director of Studies at the Institute of Policy and Strategy in Herzliya, Israel, and his partner, Jeffrey Goldberg, <laughs> who is National Correspondent for The Atlantic and Columnist for Bloomberg View. By the time the debate is over, we will have asked you two times to vote. The first time, telling us where you stand on this motion before hearing the debate, the motion being Israel can live with a nuclear Iran. Then we'll have you vote a second time after the debate is over, where you stand on the point after hearing the arguments. And the team who has no moved its numbers the most over the course of the evening will be declared our winner. So let's register your preliminary vote. Our motion is Israel can live with a nuclear Iran. If you side with this motion at this point, push number one on your keypad. If you're against it, push number two. And if you're undecided, push number three. And that is how you, our audience, will choose the winner. We go in three rounds, and first on to round one, opening statements from each debater in turn. And here to speak first for the motion, Reuven Pedetsur arguing that Israel can live with a nuclear Iran. He is a senior military affairs analyst with the Haaretz newspaper and a senior lecturer in political science at Tel Aviv University. He's a former pilot for the Israeli Air Force and serves as director of the S. Daniel Abraham Center for Strategic Dialogue at Netanya Academic Center. Ladies and gentlemen, Reuven Pedetsur. Good evening. Can Israel live in a nuclear Iran? The short answer is Yes. Any questions? <laughs> okay, but the real question is not this one. The real question, do we have another choice? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Because it's possible, despite of all pressures and sanctions, and even if there will be an Israeli military attack, that in, the, in this decade, Iran will have nuclear weapons. So the question is for the Israeli policymakers, what then? What will be our policy in this case when Iran will have the weapons? The most effective and maybe the only way to deter Iran is to abandon our ambiguity, nuclear ambiguity, and to move, to move towards unconcealed nuclear deterrence. And since in Israel we have censorship, as you know, I have to play the game. And when I refer to Israeli nuclear deterrence, Israeli nuclear weapons, Israeli nuclear submarines with nuclear missiles, it's all according to foreign sources. I don't know anything, and I have to use this phrase, according to foreign sources. But Israel has to change its policy and to move, as I say, to a nuclear deterrence and to, uh, with new rules of the game. There will be red lines that the Iranians will understand it. And then the Ayatollahs in Tehran will have to decide whether to launch their missiles when they know exactly what will happen. What will happen that Iran will be destroyed and will go back to the Middle Ages. And I don't see any Iranian national interest that justify this cost. So I believe that, that we can deter them. I believe that the other team will use the argument of irrationality. So when they use the, 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 the argument of irrationality, everybody goes to the, the Cold War and say, 
the Atullahs are not like the leaders of uh, the two superpowers. They are not going to act like the, the Soviet leaders or the American leaders, which is wrong, I believe, because if you can remember during the Cold War, how Stalin was perceived, perceived here in, 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 in the States, a madman that whenever he'll have, he'll have the bomb, he's going to drop the bomb. And the Ayatollahs are not like this. And if it seems from professional and sober analysis that the Iranian will, if, if we'll uh, learn their way of thinking, their culture, their history, they are going to act like real uh, uh, rational leaders. And ironically, possession of uh, nuclear weapons may moderate the, the Iranian leadership, exactly what happened with the Chinese leadership in 64, when they got the, the, the nuclear weapons, and they started acting like a rational state. And another, another example is India and Pakistan. Only 23 seconds more? Well, now 19. <laughs> really? Well, now it's 15. So India and Pakistan, there, was, there were three wars after there was, they, they acquired the nuclear weapons in 98. About after a year, there was a, a Kargil crisis, and they act very rationally in order not to uh, deteriorate the situation and using the nuclear war. Ruben Petitsur, your time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our motion is that Israel can live with a nuclear Iran, and here to speak against this motion, Jeffrey Goldberg. He is a national correspondent for The Atlantic and a columnist for Bloomberg View. Before joining The Atlantic, Goldberg was a Middle, Eastern correspond a Middle East correspondent and the Washington correspondent for The New Yorker. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Goldberg. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Thank you to Intelligence Squared. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you, Ruvain. Um, I, as someone who's covered Pakistan extensively, I'm not going to sit here and make believe that I would hold up Pakistan as a model of stability and <laughs> rational nuclear deterrence, but we can talk about that later. But uh, you, since you, you brought up the subject of uh, the nature of the Iranian uh, regime and what they believe and what they think and what they seek, let's talk about that for a, a minute. Uh, what we have in uh, it, it, right now in, in the world is, is, is a genuinely unprecedented situation, certainly unprecedented in the, in the post-World War II international order. We have a, a member state of the United Nations, the Islamic Republic of Iran, that actively calls for the destruction of another member state of the United Nations. That's, that is Israel. Uh, and, and, and they're very, very clear and consistent on this subject. Right from the beginning, of the Islamic Republic. I'll give you a couple of examples. This is from the supreme leader uh, of Iran, who, as his title suggests, is the supreme leader. He's the guy who sets the policy. Quote, this is from last February, the Zionist regime is a true cancer tumor on this region that should be cut off, and it definitely will be cut off. His feelings are echoed regularly in the, among the Iranian military and intelligence elite. I'll give you another example. General Golam Reza Jalali, the former commander of the Revolutionary Guard Corps, said last August that, quote, the fact is, is that there is no other way but to stand firm and resist until Israel is destroyed. General Hassan Ferozbadi, the chief of staff of the Iranian Armed Forces, said last May, and I quote, the Iranian nation is standing for its cause, which is the full annihilation of Israel. And finally, Mohammed Hassan Rahimian, who was a top aide to Khamenei, said in a January, tele January 2010 television interview, quote, we have manufactured missiles that allow us, when necessary, to replace Israel in its entirety with a big holocaust. Uh, Mr. Rahimian is the deputy minister for subtlety on the part, uh, in the Iranian <laughs> regime. Um, and, and which begs the question, what would be the impact on Middle East stability and on the safety of Israel if this regime, which seeks the annihilation, states very plainly it seeks the annihilation of the Jewish state, were to gain a weapon that would help it actually bring about that annihilation? And, and, and that's the question that we're, we're dealing with today. Now, there are 
three ways to sort of deal with this dilemma, I think. The first is to, is to sort of say, yeah, you know, uh, uh, on the one hand, it's true that the Iranian regime is the foremost sponsor of terrorism in the world, and it denies the Holocaust while calling for a new Holocaust, and, and, it's, uh, and it executes people for being gay, and it threatens Christian pastors with execution uh, unless they convert to, to, to Islam, and, and it, 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 uh, it, it's responsible for a quarter of the American combat deaths in Iraq, and it hides the lead, many leaders of Al-Qaeda within its borders. But on the other hand, no one's perfect. And, <laughs> and I'm sure that these you know, gay-hanging, Christian-persecuting, American-killing, Jew-hating mullahs, if they get hold of a bomb, will behave in a responsible, rational, and enlightened way. The third response, and this is what I want to get into during the course of this debate, the third response is to acknowledge a couple of things. One is that, is that it isn't 1938. The Jewish people do not stand defenseless and naked before the world. Iran, the day after it gets a bomb, will probably not fire that single bomb at Israel. But it's also clear that, that, that Israel in a post-nuclear Iran Middle East is going to have a very, very hard time surviving. Three quick reasons why it's going to have a hard time surviving. The first is, 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 is very clear to, to everyone, including President Obama. The, the, day after, there's going to be, the day after Iran goes nuclear, there's going to be an arms race, a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. So, so you're dealing with, in a few years' time, the possibility that four or five different countries that all hate each other are going to be pointing nuclear-tipped missiles at each other. That's not a recipe for stability or happiness. It's certainly not a recipe for stability for the Jewish state. Second reason, if you believe that Israel can only survive if it makes peace with its neighbors, then you will be opposed to the idea of Iran getting a nuclear bomb. Israel cannot survive in a Middle East in which America is a defeated and weakened ally. America is Israel's most important ally. If Iran trumps America, if Iran beats America by getting a nuclear weapon, it means that the Arab states that would pre predisposed to make peace with Israel, and we know the peace process is semi-moribund anyway, they will align with Iran because Iran is the winner of that conflict. The third and most obvious point is Hamas and Hezbollah, even now, periodically fire large numbers of rockets at Israeli civilians. Imagine the power that they will have when they can fire those rockets under the protection of the Iranian nuclear umbrella. Again, there is a real chance that an Iranian nuclear weapon would lead to a conflagration in the Middle East. Even without that conflagration, it becomes very, very hard to envision how Israel survives in the long term. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey Goldberg. And a reminder of what's going on, we are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan. We have four debaters, two against two, who are arguing it out over this motion, Israel can live with a nuclear Iran. You've heard two of the opening statements, and now on to the third, debating in support of the argument, James Dobbins. He is a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State and Special Envoy under the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations. He is now Director of the International Security and Defense Policy Center at the Rand Corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, James Dobbins. Well, just to remind us what we're debating about, the proposition is can Israel live with a nuclear Iran? Can Israel survive a nuclear Iran? To answer that question is yes, you don't need to be absolutely certain it will survive. In fact, technically, you don't even think it has to be probable that it will survive, just that it's possible that it will survive. And I think both of the opposition will acknowledge that it's possible it will survive. It would just be harder. So I mean, I think if you debate at that level, it's pretty clear. Um, there's almost nobody who thinks that Israel's demise will be automatic and certain. Uh, it's the question of risk. And we're already doing a lot to try to prevent it. We have uh, a massive, probably unprecedented, international sanctions regime, an active, if so far, uh, unproductive diplomatic process, um, a, a very active and somewhat successful covert um, sabotage effort, uh, and uh, uh, cyber attacks. Now, these may work in some combination, but I'd have to acknowledge that they may not. Now, the threshold for saying yes, that we should go to war to prevent uh, Israel from, uh, uh, Iran from gaining a nuclear weapon, really has to go, uh, there are two thresholds. One is efficacy, and one is unintended consequences. You need to look at both. In terms of efficacy, I think most 
experts believe that an Israeli attack on Iran would set the program back by perhaps two years, that an American attack would be more effective and would set it back by maybe four or five years. Um, it wouldn't prevent it, um, but it would uh, slow it down. Um, what about the unintended consequences? Well, there's, most people are concerned about uh, the possibility of counterattacks. Uh, Iran begins uh, rocketing Israel, uh, Israeli nuclear facilities, um, terrorist attacks. Um, but in many ways, the more dangerous response is, first of all, that, that, a, that an unprovoked attack on Iran validates their case for a nuclear uh, weapon, for a nuclear deterrence. Um, a second consequence is that you begin to collapse the international coalition that so far has made Iran a pariah state that has cut off its access to international markets, international, uh, not just nuclear technology, but any kind of military technology, and increasingly uh, even uh, cut back dramatically its oil sales. Uh, and as a result, I I Iran gains access um, to the world economy. Uh, it uh, breaks out of its isolation and even perhaps uh, certainly gains access to sophisticated military technology. Uh, in, the, in the aftermath of an attack, wouldn't Russia be prepared to sell uh, Iran the kind of uh, air defense systems which so far it's refused to sell um, Iran, and perhaps even uh, nuclear technology from states like uh, Pakistan or others, North Korea. But I think you have to ask yourself, which, uh, which kind of Iran would have more influence? with these dissident populations, not with governments, but with dissident populations in places like um, Gaza and um, uh, Lebanon uh, and other uh, uh, Middle East states, an Iran that had nuclear weapons, or an Iran that was uh, the victim of an unprovoked attack. The argument that Iran would be emboldened by possessing a nuclear weapon is certainly, I think, a real danger, but it's far from a certainty. It's not the historic pattern. You know, our major problems with the Soviet Union and, and particularly with China occurred before they had nuclear weapons. Once they got nuclear weapons, we didn't have any more wars. Now, we had lots of confrontations, but they were eventually um, uh, diffused. Um, uh, it, both North Korea and uh, Pakistan do behave irresponsibly on occasion, uh, but there is a certain stability in their relations with India, Pakistan's relations with India, North Korea's relations with South Korea. So the argument that they'd be emboldened to the point of actually threatening to use nuclear weapons or using nuclear weapons or even engaging in the kind of behavior that they're not engaging in now. And I think if you listen to Jeff's list of all the things they're doing, you'd have to ask, well, what the hell else could they do that they're not already doing? And I think the answer is uh, not much. Thank you, James Dobbins. <laughs> Our motion is that Israel can live with a nuclear Iran. And now our final debater, who will be speaking against the motion, Shmuel Bar. He is the director of studies at the Institute of Policy and Strategy in Herzliya. He is also a senior research fellow uh, for the International Institute for Nonproliferation Studies. He served for 30 years in the Israeli government, in the Israeli Defense Forces Intelligence, and in the office of the Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, Shmuel Bar. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first of all, I won't go into the post-attack scenarios that were brought up, but suffice to say that I could offer more optimistic scenarios. When you shuffle a deck of cards, then you play a completely new game. I recall that when we took out the Iraqi reactor, we thought it would delay it for three years, but it took about 10 years, and the Iraqis did not uh, get back to the level that they were before we took out the, um, the Aussirak. Uh, somebody, not me, McNamara, said that Castro was a rational man, Khrushchev was a rational man, Kennedy was a rational man, and three rational men almost brought their nations into utter destruction. And that was without any, I mean, Che Guevara said that it would be that if uh, Cuba had to be destroyed in order to destroy, the, uh, ca destroy capitalism, then Cuba would be thankful for that. But uh, in other words, rational people sometimes do things, or the dynamics between rational people Rational leaders sometimes leads to things which are not rational. The other thing is that strategic surprises have happened. The fact is that uh, these surprises happen and they reflect uh, dynamics which were not a, a pure uh, game theory uh, rational, uh, rational uh, behavior. 
Now, the other thing is that if nuclear weapons make countries uh, more responsible, then I would propose that the United States, which wants to uh, reduce its nuclear uh, arsenal, should now just divvy out all of the American nuclear weapons to the whole world, and then everybody will become very responsible, very rational, and peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Uh, now, now to the Cold War paradigm. The Cold War paradigm, let's define what it was. It was bilateral. It was a paradigm which from a certain stage had mutually assured destruction with each party having a, uh, a second strike capability. It was with levels of intelligence that when these, both of the United States and Soviet Union acquired that capability, the second strike capability, they also had satellites in the sky, so they had a reasonable picture of what was going on in the silos of the respective enemies. In a polynuclear Middle East where every country has a very small arsenal, they do not have mutually assured destruction. They have a sort of arsenal which is use it or lose it. If we are attacked, then we won't have a second chance. We are going to have multiple nuclear states with these small arsenals with very low levels of intelligence. They won't have satellite intelligence or very clear picture of what the real uh, intentions of their enemy uh, are. But in order to prevent unintentional use of nuclear weapons or use of nuclear weapons without total control over the process of what's called escalation dominance, you have to have very sophisticated capabilities. When you look at the command and control structures in the various countries of the Middle East and the paradigms which existed in the Cold War countries, you actually discover that most of the key elements which were instrumental in preventing nuclear uh, confrontation during the Cold War do not exist in the Middle East and cannot exist for various reasons, some of them because of the military culture, the political culture, etc. Issues such as verification, of authority, um, is separation of uh, authority over the delivery systems and the weapons. All of those things which made it more difficult suddenly to rush into nuclear conf confrontation. Things like uh, permissive ac action links which prevented unintentional use. So all to put together, uh, we are talking about a very volatile region. And as a final note, um, we also have to address the issue of the taboo of nuclear weapons. Uh, religious uh, experts in Iran and in the Sunni world all ask themselves, what is a nuclear bomb? Since there can be nothing which the Prophet Muhammad didn't speak about, they have decided that a nuclear bomb is like a catapult. It's just a big catapult. Because a catapult used to be thrown over the walls of a city and you didn't see who it killed, so it's indiscriminate killing. Well, that's like a nuclear weapon. Uh, I think that uh, somebody who sees a nuclear weapon uh, like a catapult is well, Bar, somebody I'm sorry, who your time have. is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. And now we go on to round two where the debaters address each other directly and answer questions from you in the audience and from me. And I just want to uh, start off the questions by getting to this notion of the, um, of the moderating influence of having a nuclear weapon that Ruven Petitsur uh, talked about. He talked about the fact that when, when China and when Mao got the bomb uh, in 1964, uh, that he became a lot less quote unquote crazy in that sense that he was depicted and thought of in the West, uh, that he became a lot more sober minded as a geopolitical thinker and strategist because presumably because of the stakes. And I just want to put that to the other side uh, and take it to Jeffrey Goldberg first. Um, the, the notion that, in, you, you addressed it a little bit in your response, but I would just like a little bit uh, more detail in, in recognizing what his argument actually is, that things did change in China at that time. So take on that question, Jeffrey Goldberg. Well, I, first I would say that there's only a limited amount of knowledge we can gain uh, by analogizing the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party of 1965 with the mullahs who rule the theocratic authoritarian state of Iran in 2013. I, I really, I don't want to stretch this to the breaking point, and I feel like that, that does stretch it to the breaking point. Yes, it's possible. It's possible that Iran will become suddenly a responsible party, but it is revolutionary in nature. I think by the time China reached nuclear status, it had been, it, it, it was growing into something else. Iran's specific goal is to export the Islamic Revolution 
throughout the Muslim world, its specific goal is to destroy Israel, its specific goal is to liberate Bahrain, um, a country that has all of these goals, which gains a nuclear weapon, is not going to suddenly say, all right, now that we have the weapon that will finally allow us to do all of the things that we've been telling you we want to do, we're not going to do it. Okay, Ruhl van Petitor, Jeffrey Goldberg saying that Iran is not China of 1964 in significant ways. Iran is not China, I agree. Oh, we can Absolutely, go home Absolutely, but, <laughs> but the, China is not alone. Let's talk about India, Pakistan. Let's see that uh, South Korea lives under the shadow of North Korea nuclear umbrella. So it happens to every leadership that acquired. The and, and what do you think happens to them? And I want to take your answer back to Because Jeffrey. they know what is the, the price of using the, the, the weapons. There is no winning in nuclear war. So in this case, they, 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 they know exactly what will happen, and that, that makes okay. them... So uh, Jeffrey, let me give you an example. We're talking about the, the Iranians, that they are irrational. Let's talk about Khomeini. He was very extremist, right? In 1980, when the war with Iran began, erupted, he said that he'll never sign a ceasefire agreement with Iraq until they surrendered. In 88, they started launching missiles, conventional missiles in Tehran, thousands of people dead, and he signed an agreement because the, the price was too high. And we are talking about conventional missiles, not nuclear missiles. Okay, so Jeffrey, Rubin gave you the logic behind his, his analogy of China, that the, the gravity of the, the damage, the destruction that the weapons can do will change any leader's thinking. Well, first of all, let me come back to Pakistan, because I've done a lot of reporting on Pakistan. Pakistan is moving away from minimal deterrence. We know that Pakistan now is mating its weapons and putting them on mobile launchers. So I, I, I would c caution not to use Pakistan as a great model for right. where Take we're going. Kargil, but, but, Kargil crisis, I'm just for saying, example. But let me, let, me just, let me just also say this. I think we're actually also talking about the wrong thing. The thing that I worry about more than... Are you doing, are you doing a subject change what? to avoid the question? I am not avoiding the question. <laughs> okay. What? All right. Well, no, no, but I'm not avoiding I know I'm going directly at the question by changing the question. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I don't... Th I, 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 just, I just think he gave you the logic. Sure. And it's got some power sure. to it. Sure, but let me answer the question by saying I don't necessarily think that Ayatollah Khamenei is going to one day wake up and decide to launch a preemptive nuclear strike on Israel because he wants to destroy Israel. What I'm much more concerned about is accidental escalation leading to an all-out nuclear war. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. What happened two months ago? Hamas fires rockets into Israel. Israel fires back. Hamas escalates. Israel then escalates. Imagine if Iran was in the picture with a nuclear weapon right now. No, just imagine this. Imagine that Iran, in response to Israel's escalation, decides to move warheads closer to their missile launching sites. And the American satellites so, see this. You're in a, you'll be living in a Middle East of launch on warning. You'll be living in a situation in which the Israeli prime minister is going to say, the, the Iranians are moving their missiles to strike us in defense of Hamas. What do I do? We know Jim, that the prime Jim minister Jim already wants to do this. Let Jim Dobbins respond to that. Well, I, I don't think the Israeli counterstrike is vulnerable. I mean, the Israelis have nuclear weapons that can't be located, can't be destroyed. Jim, could you come just a touch um, closer to your mic? And so I think that, that, that launch on warning is not uh, a necessary strategy for the Israelis. Um, it you might mean be wait till Tel Aviv is it, bombed and then launch against Iran? I, I think they would. Uh, it, it, I mean, it would obviously depend on the circumstances. If they thought There's they, only three cities if in Israel the size of Staten Island. I mean, Jeffrey, it's going to be, on, yeah. I'll let him answer. I mean, you know, the United States was just as vulnerable as Israel. We had 24,000 nuclear weapons uh, lo uh, locked in on us. They would have damaged us just as badly as half a dozen on Israel. The, the result would have been the same, and it probably would have been worse for the rest of the world. Indeed, it, it would have been catastrophic for the world as a whole. Uh, and we lived with that for 40 years. And all of these problems of launch on warning. Now, I, I quite take the fact that, that, that these regimes don't have the control mechanisms, the command and control, or even the technologies that will, uh, that will make this a safer world. And so I, you know, I fully acknowledge that there's an element of risk there. I fully acknowledge that Israel shouldn't live with a nuclear Iran if there's a better option. I'm just arguing that there may not be a better option. Shmulevar. 
Yeah, well, first of all, regarding uh, rationalism in Khomeini, Khomeini, uh, two years after the Iraqi invasion of Iran, he could have signed a, uh, a, 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 an agreement, he could have stopped the war, but he continued with the war. And the reason that he finally uh, uh, agreed to a ceasefire was because the Revolutionary Guards it, uh, actually imposed it on him. The other thing is that Iran isn't, unlike China, which was going through a process when it acquired nuclear weapons, China was already moderating its revolutionary zeal. The, uh, Iran is going through what we would call the second uh, generation of the revolution. I mean, we're already in the sort of uh, um, a Robespierre uh, style uh, uh, second generation of the, of the Iranian revolution going back to the pure concepts of the revolution. Uh, now, but that really isn't the, uh, the real issue here. Um, the real issue here, I think, is that uh, analogies are absolutely irrelevant. You never walk into the same stream in the same place twice, and certainly when one stream is in China and the other is in the Middle East. Secondly, uh, the dynamics of multilateral uh, nuclear states is completely different to the dynamics of two main Let powers. Let me remind you, it was not bilateral. It, it was, was bilateral. trilateral. No, it, no, no, China it, no, no. China, China never had the strategic capabilities of the Soviet Union, and the Chinese didn't have the missile capabilities at the time, and most of the Cold War was clearly a uh, Warsaw Pact against the NATO, against NATO. It was clearly bilateral. So the fact that nominally you also had Britain and France, et cetera, and you had China, that did not make it multilateral. So it doesn't matter, though, because we're not talking, uh, and uh, as a historian, I find it difficult to discuss analogies because uh, we think that historians tend to think that uh, God is in the details. And the details of the Middle East are that uh, we will have multi uh, a polynuclear Middle East where we will have a Sunni world which is going to see an, uh, a, a Shiite nuclear power as an existential threat to the Sunni world. Anybody who's read the bestseller in Saudi Arabia of the Protocols of the Elders of Qom, which tells how the Elders of Qom want to destroy Mecca and Medina, realize that they see this as existential as well. And so we have to understand that this is the situation, and this situation does not all here well for stability. All right, let me, let me put a different, uh, bring in a different strain of the argument here. Uh, to the side that's arg arguing that Israel can live with a nuclear Iran, your opponents have pointed out that the specific rhetoric of the Iranian regime has discussed a deep aspiration to see Israel gone, wiping Israel off the map. Reuven Petitsur, wh why not take that absolutely literally? By the way, they have never threatened Israel with uh, nuclear weapons. Never, never. You you never find I beg to one. Do you, do you, very quickly, very quickly. No, 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 do, because, do, you, because wait, do you concede that point no. that they have never threatened no, 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 to use nuclear not, weapons I, against I can, Israel? They, they, actually, they don't admit I, that they are developing the, ne the, no, the no, weapons. No, so no, no. They can they have alluded to that, and they, anybody who uh, who reads the materials coming out of uh, uh, media which is uh, related to the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. I'm not even going back to Rafsanjani with his famous statement, but, uh, the, uh, but uh, very senior Iranian people connected to, uh, to Khamenei have made allusions which could clearly be uh, understood. Uh, that. All right, that's different from, Ru Ruben is saying they've never explicitly said, we well, will uh, get well, a nuclear excuse, weapon excuse and use it if, to destroy if, Israel. If the Ayatollah Khamenei's aide, Rahimian, is saying that he's gonna replace Israel with a big holocaust, I don't think they're putting pumpkins on the catapults. You know, I mean, I don't think you have to stretch so it. So th this is their know. rhetoric. This is their rhetoric for yeah. other reasons. They are right. not going to so, so you're saying that they, they don't mean it? They don't. Uh, um, no, if, no, I, if, they could, if they could do it, they, they would have done it. But they don't mean that they're going to use the, the nuclear weapons in order to achieve this goal. No, no way. Uh, uh, I think that one of the problems, and uh, this I must say, uh, here I, I'm co uh, um, we as Israelis tend to believe people who think that, who say that they want to exterminate us. We have some very very good historic uh, precedents that people said that somebody said they want to exterminate us and they tried to do it so, you, so i i don't i so I, I don't believe clear. i don't believe in rhetoric i think that rhetoric uh, becomes action when it can become action jim for you also this question if the iranians are so explicit about their desire to see israel gone whether they use an active verb or a passive verb 
should the Israelis not take that literal, with literal seriousness? I mean, I think what a benign explanation, and I'm not arguing that, there, that one should necessarily accept the benign explanation is, that the Iranians are simply arguing for a multi-ethnic state encompassing all of historic Israel um, to include the West Bank, um, uh, which is the, the Hamas position, for instance. It's not that the Israelis should go away, it's that Israel should go away, and that a multi-ethnic state encompassing both Palestinians and Israelis should continue to exist. I interestingly enough, the, uh, there are uh, extremists, but uh, viable parties in Israel who also think that the Israeli state should encompass all of the West Bank. Okay. So the difference is that they think it should be a Jewish state, whereas right. the so Iranians you know, would argue it should be a multi-ethnic state. Uh, well, uh, Jeffrey I, Goldberg. Much, uh, uh, just very briefly on that. What, what happened was I Israel's enemies realized that talking about pushing the Jews into the sea was not really a great PR strategy. Right. So what they did was they changed the language and they said, we don't want to push the Jews in the sea. We just want to get rid of Israel as a Jewish homeland and let everybody live there together. Um, but then they also say, as the Ayatollahs say, all the Jews who aren't from there have to go back to where they're from, which leads to these incredible statements. And I heard this from, from many uh, so Iranian go, officials. No many Iranian officials the say bomb. the Jews should go back. The Jews from Germany should go back to Germany. The Jews from Poland should but go Jeffrey, back to Poland. But Jeffrey, I think what Jim's saying is that the, is that, is that the you could interpret the, and I'm not saying this facetiously, the Iranians are, there's a, they're, they're not saying we will kill you, they're saying we want you dead, which is not exactly the same uh, thing, I, which has to do with... We want a lot of you dead, and we certainly want your country and your dream of a Jewish homeland dead. So, you know, to Israelis and to Jewish people... But it means would they be the agents of that killing? Were they able to get away with it? But I, they I, already I just, tried, I, just, I, I just want they to already note, tried. I, I good, don't good, think of good, the, good, about good Hamas. They they I, I think that get Hamas was mentioned. They already tried. Wait, wait, wait. I, I love it when everybody's talking yeah, once. It's so I, exciting, I but I, we need to, I know we need to have some order. Well, you go first, Shmuel, yeah. then you, Ruben. I know a thing or two about Hamas, and I, I, I read their websites avidly. Maybe that's an aberration. And on their main website, they have constantly the hadith from the prophet saying that the last day will not come until the Muslims kill all the Jews and the last Jew will hide behind a rock or a stone and the rock will call out, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. Now, I don't call this That's a multi-ethnic uh, multi state. Uh, 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 wait, wait. Have you uh, seen and this is constantly, and they have these uh, on their TV, you have children, called up to quote it, and they get prizes for quoting things like that. I don't uh, think have that. you seen the Rosen website of uh, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef? Uh, it doesn't what he's come talking about? That. Look, 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 we're not arguing, by the way, that the Lubavitcher should get nuclear weapons. I mean, you know, I, I, have, you know this. I have a general, I have a general predisposition against letting Nut job religious fundamentalists, that's the technical it term. It will be nice Nut job if they don't of all have stripes the... get hold of nuclear weapons. It's a pretty simple point. It's very nice if they don't have their weapons, but if they'll have, then what? If then they what? have, yes. I think we already described what, what could happen. Jim Dobbins made the point that uh, he, he asked, what actually would the Iranians be able to start doing that they're not already doing in terms of killing Jews around the world and in terms of uh, encouraging attacks from Hamas and Hezbollah and being generally mischievous and deadly. What, what would be different if they had a nuclear weapon? Jeffrey Goldberg. They, they have limitless escalation. Like I said, if Hamas has the protection of the nuclear umbrella, the Iranian nuclear umbrella, it can be much bolder than it is today. Israel will then have to Doing fear, what? Yeah. More what? than 1,000 missiles? Yeah. 20,000? Yeah. No, yeah. they don't Hezbollah have. has 50,000 missiles sitting in Lebanon in pointed Lebanon, at Israel right no. now. Jim yeah. Dobbins, it right was now. your point. Let's hear your response to it. Please. But, you know, I mean, quoting from extremist websites is one thing, but as far as I know, the largest Jewish population in the Middle East that doesn't live in Israel lives in Iran. The largest what? The what? Jewish population in the Middle East that doesn't live in Israel lives in Iran. The there's, largest there's like Jewish 20, population that doesn't live in Israel in the Middle East okay. lives in Iran. <clears throat> Got it. Uh, 
can, but can you, can so if they wanted to start killing Jews, they'd have an easy opportunity. No, <laughs> uh, the Jews in Iran are under what it's called vimi. They are under protection. That's something else. But, uh, but, but Jim, I just before and you get to that, Jews have fled Jim, Iran I want you to get back. I want it, I want you to defend your opening point that Jeffrey just refuted that Iran, Look, I mean, Iran having a nuclear weapon wouldn't be doing much more than it's already doing. He says, yes, they would because they could, they could I don't, escalate with under protection. Nuclear weapons are extremely useful to deter uh, people from using other nuclear weapons or from destroying their regime. There was one option that the United States would lose if Iran had a nuclear weapon, which it's lost with respect to North Korea, um, and that is to invade and overthrow the regime. We, that would be off the table. We might do other things to them. We've got 5,000 nuclear weapons. They've got two or three. There's almost nothing we could do to them short of threatening to overthrow the regime, which would cause them to use their nuclear weapons. Um, and I think Israel and, and, uh, has never had the capacity of invading and overthrowing the regime. Uh, and it, Israel's not going to use its nuclear weapons to respond to rocket attacks from Hamas. Um, uh, it's got other conventional responses to that, which it can fall back on whether Iran has nuclear weapons or not. And Iran is not going to start a nuclear war to protect Hamas. I, I totally disagree to that uh, nuclear weapons are only for deterrence. They actually have only been used for deterrence in, so in a very limited case uh, that we know of the Cold War. But nuclear weapons can be used for compellents. And uh, if you imagine Iran having a certain window of opportunity when the rest of the Middle East has not acquired nuclear weapons, and they do have an agenda. The Iranians are making it clear, uh, actually they've, uh, they've escalated their rhetoric about Bahrain being part of Iran, which was stolen by the Brits. They would probably take advantage of it to brandish nuclear weapons as a, uh, as a means of compellence in order to get the level of hegemony in the Gulf and in the Middle East before the rest of the countries do acquire nuclear weapons. So I think that that is the most likely scenario. So it's not only what they could do against Israel, but what they do against Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, trying so, to, uh, so, and so uh, oil. Uh, there's Tommy's no historic here. example of successful compellence since 1945. There's no case in which a nuclear power used its nuclear power to compel they, they some other country. Powers. Britain and France got thrown out of every single colony they had in the world while they we were, were nuclear powers, and, and, their, but and, and their colonial have, powers weren't. Analogies warm. of such small sets have absolutely no scientific uh, re relevance. You know, you but you, you say that I, I'm, I'm bothered. Years, I'm bothered by that. I'm bothered by that because that gives us nothing to talk about from history. <laughs> right. I mean, history no. is. I mean, all we, we we've, we've got to we've got to look back to some degree. I, I mean, it's yes, your response but, every time. You every to, time they bring up something from history, you say it's irrelevant. No, no. From history, you can bring up things from history, but you have to bring up things from relevant history in a relevant region, in relevant uh, circumstances and culture. So what, what is relevant? What happened between Shmuel. the United States and the Soviet Union, France and Britain? Uh, what have, is relevant? has nothing to do with what happens in a region where uh, people I think we're having an Israeli moment here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is Je relevant? Jeffrey, Jeffrey, said, <laughs> Jeffrey said that Israel uh, will have hard time. We always have hard time. No, so look. Nothing I, will change. Yeah. Yeah, you always have a hard time. Some of it's self-inflicted. Some of it's inflicted from outside. The proportion of the stuff that's going to be inflicted from outside is going to grow much greater. You know, and Jim Dobbins is right. I mean, he's right. The day after Iran gets a nuke, you know, chances are Israel will still survive. I mean, and, 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 it's, and it's a remote possibility that Israel could survive two or three or four years. But so I really do believe, I really do believe that in a, a Iran getting a nuclear weapon, and by the way, we're not, it's, not the, it's not the Israelis who believe this, it's the U.S. that believes this. Well, Jeff, President you Obama. said two or three years Israel would survive? I yeah. think, look, I believe that every three to four, let's say every three to four years, there's another confrontation between Israel and one of Iran's proxies on its northern border or its southern border. That is nothing the to next do time there's one of these conflicts, I'm afraid that they're going to spin out of control. By that point, Saudi Arabia might have nukes, Turkey might have nukes, Egypt might have nukes. I don't see this as, as President Obama said repeatedly, that is, you know, to introduce so many nuclear weapons into such a small space that is already politically unstable, politically volatile, is a recipe for disaster. So, so when Jim Dobbins said this debate isn't literally saying Israel can survive, you actually are taking it literally, that you think Israel cannot survive. Oh, I read the instruction sheet wrong? Yeah. I, oh, really? <laughs> um, no, I, I, believe that, I believe that it makes it, that it, makes it 
the very, demo- very, the dem- I, I, look, Israel, why does Israel survive and thrive now? It survives because it's an immigration nation. Who's going to immigrate to a country that's on a hair-trigger nuclear alert that lives under this Iranian nuclear umbrella? Well, I mean, you're not to the United you, States, Jeffrey, with 25,000 missiles aimed at every target in the state. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but it was never the the, the level and I of the, the level of animosity and the level of the level don't, of conflict uh, was never like it is. Uh, you know, you should survive forever, and that's what we're talking about. And and I just don't see I don't see the Middle East that's polynuclear as a hospitable place for it's a small Jewish nice state that already has multiple dysfunctions. I agree, it's not a nice neighborhood. There, there's no autumn. <laughs> Let's hear your questions. Front row, gentlemen, right here. Sure, my name is Randy Slifka, and uh, Mr. Dobbins, the answer to your question is to mow the grass. That's what can be done. But I just want to follow up on Mr. Goldberg's uh, line of thinking, which is the economic analysis, which is how many uh, thousands of people will actually, human capital, will leave Israel? How much actual capital, billions of dollars? Who is going to actually invest in Israel, given the fact there is no margin for error and not only do you have explicitly nuclear weapons pointed at you, but you also have the danger of dirty bombs and technology transfer okay. within the country. That's within a great the city question, itself. and it was really well done, let me just you know, say. I mean, That's the model. Go ahead, know, Jim Dobbins. I mean, the United States had a peer competitor that had, in many cases, more nuclear weapons than we did. People invested. We had huge immigration. People went to New York and Washington, and they knew that they were going to be exterminated if there was a war. They were right in the hair trigger. Whatever, wherever else the bombs felt, they were going to fell there. Did it stop building? Did it stop immigration? I, I don't know if everybody will leave Israel. I'll probably be the one who turns off the lights at uh, <laughs> Ben Gurion Airport. But uh, I, I think it is absolutely ridiculous and absurd to compare a situation in which a country which is, uh, has declared that it wants to exterminate a state, the state of Israel has nuclear weapons, as opposed to the balance which existed post-Cuba between the United States and the Soviet Union, even though they both had nuclear weapons. It, it's, uh, you can make those analogies, but they have absolutely nothing to do with not reality. It, it, it's, not, it's not a real analogy. Uh, and I, I, I think that it would certainly have an effect. By the way, an interesting poll in Israel uh, it was taken, and people were asked, will you leave the country if uh, Iran gets a nuclear weapon? It turned out that whereas somewhere around 30% of the Jews said they would think about it, 70% of the Israeli Arabs said they would think about it. I can't, uh, Ahmed, I'm a Muslim author. Um, to my colleagues, uh, Mr. Barr and Mr. Goldberg, I would say what's different and what you're arguing clearly is that the new ingredient is virulent political Islamism which both of you have touched upon, which changes the equation, not just the uh, polynuclear conflict. I think that's what makes this so much more dangerous than anything um, history has previously seen in terms of the Cold War. Would you agree and could you expand? Wait, are you asking them if, you're, you're saying you agree with them? I agree. But then you're I, asking them if they agree with you. I, and also, I agree. <laughs> but, 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 but do you, I, want, but do you not want to put that question is, to this side? As, as you're the moderator, but I think that's the part that's overlooked entirely. So take, t- turn that into a question for this side, because I think that's what your intention really yeah, is to Why do. do you not feel that the ingredient of political Islamism, which is actually decimating so many Muslim states politically and ideologically and contributes to the destabilization in Pakistan, the country of my heritage, is not a destructive factor that is alien from the previous 60 years of nuclear um, uh, armaments. Well, Jim Dobbins. Uh, first of all, I don't, I, you know, Iran has been a virulently Islamist state for 30 years now, 40 years? 79. 79. Um, uh, it's probably a little less virulent now than it was, but it's still a virulent Islamist state. Uh, and yet it hasn't behaved uh, irresponsibly in the sense of doing anything that endangers its existence. The regime has done lots of outrageous things, but none of them threatened its existence. None of them threatened the uh, continuity of the regime. Um, Iran, in fact, hasn't invaded anybody for 500 years, so it's not as if they have territorial claims. They're promoting subversion. They're promoting uh, overthrow of hostile regimes. Um, They're uh, engaging in terrorism, and I would anticipate that they would continue to do so. 
At no point has either American or Israeli nuclear weapons deterred them from that. I don't think there's any level of that that they could engage in that would result in a nuclear strike on our part. And therefore, I don't think that their having nuclear weapons would particularly affect that kind of behavior, which would, we would continue to have to respond to forcefully and on, on, uh, at times, and certainly rigorously, uh, but I don't think it would be notably harder. Jeffrey and Gilbert. as far as Islam in the Arab world, or for that matter in the South Asian world, I don't know that it's particularly you know, relevant to this problem. It, it's certainly a challenge. And Jeffrey well, well, you know, to answer the question, the saving grace, one of the saving graces of, of the Cold War was that the, the Soviets were atheists and that they didn't, uh, they didn't envision uh, this world as simply the anteroom to a superior afterlife. And so I do think you have to take into account, not just with Islam, but, but with, with I, I, as I said before, fundamentalist Jewish parties in Israel, I wouldn't want to see controlling nuclear weapons. We're entering the age of political Islamism in the Middle East. The Muslim Brotherhood is in charge of Egypt today. In another year, it's going to be in charge of Syria. Um, ask yourself, I'll you know, answer this question with a question to the audience in a way, which is, would you be comfortable having the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt be in control of nuclear weapons? Would you be comfortable having the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria be in charge of, of nuclear weapons? And for that matter, would you, would, you, would you be happy if the chief rabbis of Israel had nuclear weapons? Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. The chief rabbis of Israel do not have nuclear weapons. Uh, they, uh, you know, I, I don't want people who think that this world is simply a prelude to the next to, to, to help bring us there sooner. <laughs> Oh, Fari Kress. Um, many times the supreme leader has made a distinction between Zionism and Judaism. And many of the people in the regime have often said that they have nothing against Judaism. They have a Jewish MP. There's a very large synagogue that covers about four blocks in Tehran. You see many Jews, not many, but I would say you see a few Jews going around, you know, with their distinct caps. Ma'am, where, where are you going with My this? My question is this, is that do you really believe that the Mullah-hating Mullah Jews are who you claim they are? I mean, do they really hate the Jews when so many Iranian Jews of the older generation have returned to Iran? So and, you, are and, and your point being that this undermines the... Jeffrey's, what I'm Jeffrey's saying is argument that, that, yeah, that, my, that my the, question is that they don't really want to possibly annihilate the state of Israel more than maybe change the nature of the regime so it becomes more multi-ethnic. Would you agree to that? Okay, Jeffrey Goldberg. Israel is the homeland and state of the Jewish people. They want to deny the Jewish people their right to a Jewish homeland and a Jewish state they threaten to use violence and use violence to do that. I'm sure some of Ayatollah Khamenei's best friends are Jews, and I'm sure that people walk around the streets of Tehran with kippot on. Um, I would point out that, yes, there's a synagogue open in Tehran. When Natan Sharansky and the Refuseniks were in jail in the Soviet Union, there were five synagogues open in Moscow. It's not relevant. The, the, the vast majority of Iranian Jews have fled the country. There was a population of 200,000. They're down to 25,000 now. Uh, it's, not, it's not relevant. The Iranian regime is very happy to have their Jews living in protected second-class status, uh, and that's the way they, they like it. That's the Iranian regime. The Iranian people, by the way, are not anti-Semitic uh, on the whole, but the regime most definitely is. And that concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, <laughs> where our motion is Israel can live with a nuclear Iran. And we are about to move on to round three, which will be brief closing statements from each debater in turn. They will be two minutes each. And this is their last chance to try to influence your vote. Immediately after their closing statements, we'll have our second vote. And remember, it's the team that has moved your numbers the most in the course of the debate who will be declared our winner. And here to summarize his position against the motion, Jeffrey Goldberg, national correspondent for The Atlantic and columnist for Bloomberg View. Thank you, John. Uh, I want to just tell a very brief uh, story. Uh, in 1998, I was in Afghanistan, in, in Kandahar, uh, when Osama bin Laden issued his first fatwa, the first big fatwa, the fatwa against crusaders and Jews. And I was with a bunch of people, Westerners, and we heard about this, and frankly, we, we, we laughed about it because it seemed uh, crazy 
absolutely insane, uh, the, the audacity of it. And, uh, you know, I, I learned three years later that very often when someone who says something that, that seems crazy uh, says it over and over again, uh, that it's, it's worth paying attention to. And so on my visits to Iran, uh, and I've, I've been there a few times, uh, I've talked to people in the, in the regime uh, about these subjects. I'll tell you one very brief encounter I had with a guy named Muhammad Ali Samadi, who was a leader of a group called the Seekers of Martyrdom, uh, which actually sounds like a great name for a band, actually. <laughs> uh, but their job at the time was to try to figure out how to kill Salman Rushdie. And, and, uh, but I talked to him about Israel, and, uh, and he, he said the following, which has always stayed with me. Um, there are always infectious, infections and diseases in man. In the world, there is an infection called international Jewry. And I listened to him, and I listened to, to the various leaders of the regime, and I've decided to take them seriously. I think in the post-9-11 age, we have to take religious fundamentalists who say they want to kill you seriously. I think it is possible to overlearn the, the, overlearn the lessons of Jewish history, to overlearn the lessons of the Holocaust. But I'm even more afraid of underlearning the lessons of Jewish history. I believe that the Iranian regime is serious about wanting to find a way to destroy the state of Israel. I believe that if they get a nuclear weapon, they will go a great distance to achieving that goal. And therefore, I, I ask you to vote against this resolution, vote against this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey Goldberg. Our motion is Israel can live with a nuclear Iran. And here to summarize his position in support of the motion, Reuven Peretzur, a senior military affairs analyst with Haaretz. Thank you. It's very frightening to live under this shadow of uh, this hostile regime with nuclear weapons. And I, I have no illusions. The Ayatollahs are not uh, lovers of Zion, but they are very rational, and they want to survive, and they want to rule their country. And at the end, they, they are not going to use the weapons. We can live with a nuclear run. I live in Tel Aviv. This is the, the center of the target. And I didn't ask my four daughters and my grandchildren to leave Israel. Because I believe that we can leave Israel and survive more than three years. A nuclear Iran is not the end of Zionism. Thank you. Thank you, Rosen Petitur. Our motion is Israel can live with a nuclear Iran. And here summarizing his position against the motion, Shmuel Bar, he is Director of Studies at the Institute of Policy and Strategy in Herzliya, Israel. Thank you. Um, I want to just reiterate that rationality of every single individual involved in a conflict is not a guarantee that the conflict will end uh, or will develop uh, in a rational manner or in a way which uh, uh, everybody would be happy with. In the end, uh, history shows us that uh, a lot of things happened which everybody's sorry about that it's bad for everybody. Uh, during the Cold War, there were a number of instances where the United States and the Soviet Union, with all of their command and control capabilities, with all of their intelligence, uh, actually came to some uh, very, uh, um, uh, very dangerous uh, points which were avoided because the leaderships had a means of communication. Now, the level of hostility in the Middle East does not augur well for direct communications between not even, not only Israel-Iran, but Iran-Saudi Arabia, and, and we're talking about a Middle East in which countries are falling apart, and that sub-countries may acquire the nuclear weapons that they will inherit from the countries which are disintegrating. We're talking about a region which is, uh, I call this the Humpty Dumpty stage, that they're falling apart and nobody will put them together again. Uh, this is a very dangerous area to have nuclear weapons. Uh, ultimately, uh, the question is not, well, can you do anything about it? If you can't do anything about it, live with it. But uh, you have to do something about it. You've got to find a way. And believe me, there are more than one ways to skin a cat, even a Persian cat. Thank you, Shmuel Abar. The motion, Israel can live with a nuclear Iran, and here... To summarize his position in support of the motion, James Dobbins. He's director of the International Security and Defense Policy Center at RAND. Well, I'm, I'm old enough to remember um, when in, uh, in elementary school we were taught to hide under our desks under nuclear attack. 
duck and cover, and you know, sirens would go off and we would hide under our desks. So you know, some level of fear and concern is natural enough in a society that faces that kind of threat. And if you can avoid the threat, by all means do so if you have a better choice. We didn't have a better choice at the time. Um, uh, 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 Reuven has suggested that, um, uh, that uh, nuclear Iran will not be the end of the Jewish state. And uh, I'd have to say most Israelis agree with him. Uh, the Times of uh, Israel uh, published a poll last week, uh, a poll done in the context of their election campaign, in which they asked uh, uh, the uh, Israeli populace what were the issues that, most, uh, that created most anxiety? What were they most worried about? Was Iran the number one issue? No. Uh, economic issues were their dominant concern. Was Iran the number two issue? No. Actually, and perhaps rather healthily, the deterioration uh, in relations with the Palestinians was the number two concern. Was Iran the number three concern? No. The, three con the third concern was the state of their education system. Iran was the fourth uh, in this list of six, uh, with 12% of the uh, er Israeli population thinking that the Iranian threat was their principal concern. Thank you, James Dobbins. And that concludes our closing statements. And now it's time to learn which side you feel argued the best this evening. We're asking you again to go to the keypads at your seat, as you did at the beginning of the debate. The motion, Israel can live with a nuclear Iran, if after hearing the debate you've been moved to the side or stayed at that side. Press number one. If your position is or became against, push number two. And if you remained or became undecided, push number three. So remember, we've had you vote twice, and the team whose numbers moves by the largest percentage point is declared our winner. So let's find out who you decided won this debate. The motion, Israel can live with a nuclear Iran, before the debate, in polling you in the live audience, 25% of you agreed with the motion, 35% were against it, and 40% were decided. The second vote now, the team arguing for the motion, they went from 25% to 37%. That is a 12% increase. That is the number to beat. Now let's look at the team against the motion. They went from 35% to 55%. They went up 20%. That's the winning side. The team arguing against the motion, Israel can live with a nuclear Iran, has won our debate. That's it for this time. Thank you for me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared US. We'll see you next time.